My family used to go to the beach every summer. For me, that was my favorite thing to do all year long, hearing the seagulls, the sound of the ocean pounding on the beach. For me, that was just grounding and relaxing and fascinating all at the same time. The physicality of the ocean is one of the things that, as a kid, attracted me the most. That thrill of just having that ocean energy push me along. You could just ride all day. There was no lift tickets. There was no fees to get into the ocean. When I describe to people what it's like to dive on a coral reef, they're like, oh, I never thought about that. They've never had a shark swim right beside them. Look them in the eye and give them a little fright for a second before they realize that the shark just wonders what I'm doing, just like I wonder what the shark is doing. I started free diving. So when I think of diving, I really think of free diving. Like, this is what whales do, right? Take a big breath of air and they hold that oxygen inside their body. This ability to free dive down to where the scuba divers were, swim around and come back up, was just so free, nothing on, no equipment. I just love that, it made me feel like a fish. When I did my first submersible dive, I realized it wasn't just that I was meant to be out on ships. I was supposed to be in the bottom. I don't think anyone has ever measured endorphins in submarines, but I can tell you they're probably through the roof. The first time I was in a submarine, I saw that life down there and 50 new questions popped into my brain. That wouldn't have come up because it was this immersive experience and I just felt it. When you're in a submarine and you're looking at these magical environment, you're overwhelmed by this sense of wonder. You're humbled by this feeling of, there's so much I don't know about the world. And you're stimulated to figure out how this all works together. I'm a marine biologist. I'm someone who studies the ocean from as many angles as I can. When my kids ask me what I do for a living, I tell them that I'm an explorer. I'm an aquanaut. I dive down to the bottom of the ocean and I see things that people have never seen before. How lucky am I to be able to share this amazing habitat with the rest of the world? As a child, I had no idea how important the ocean is, that the great majority of life on Earth is in the sea, that the greatest diversity of life is in the sea. My name is Sylvia Earle. I'm a scientist, an oceanographer, an ocean explorer, I have spent years at sea aboard ships and thousands of hours under the sea. I've seen things others have not. If others could see what I've witnessed, they would know how much the ocean has changed, and they would know why caring for the ocean matters to everyone, everywhere. The ocean is Earth's life support system, generating most of the oxygen in the atmosphere, capturing much of the carbon dioxide produced by human actions. The ocean is the planet's living blue heart. Every creature has a story. Every one, whether you're looking at a little crab or a starfish or a shark. If people stayed on the shore and never got underwater, how would we ever know that fish, that they have communities, they have faces? Their importance as fellow citizens, as cultures, as amazing creatures that we can learn from. There's a lot of water we now know elsewhere in the solar system and elsewhere in space. But to have a, a liquid ocean with frozen polar areas, it's taken four and a half billion years to shape the world in a way that is favorable to humankind. It's taken us about four and a half decades to significantly unravel systems. No ocean, no life. No ocean, no us. My name is Shane Garrow, and I'm the founder of the Dominica Sperm Whale Project. I've been following the lives of sperm whale families in the Caribbean Sea based off the beautiful nature island of Dominica. I've had the sort of greatest honor to spend thousands of hours in the company of the sperm whale families. And over the last 15 years, we've come to know 30 different families. We know about 10 of those personally. My research focuses mostly on the connection between these families' lives and what they say to each other, and how they succeed in the ocean by living in these small families. 
They live these rich and complex lives in part of the ocean that we find difficult to even explore. Sperm whale society is matrilineal, meaning it's grandmothers and daughters that will live together for life. The young males live in the family until they're about teenagers, and then they go on this sort of open ocean wander for about 15 to 20 years before they are breeding age. But females will stay together for life. They communally raise and defend their babies, and they live in this sort of community of neighboring families just like we do. Behavior is what you do, but culture is how you've learned to do it. In the same way that we're all humans, but some of us eat with chopsticks and some of us eat with a fork. We're all still eating, but how we've learned to eat is importantly different. The secret for how these animals are surviving are these traditional behaviors, and that's why every calf counts. Every female calf is critically important, and each one of those that we lose, we lose so much potential. I think one thing that my research has shown is that our lives are really similar. The values that we have in our families, love your mom, be a good neighbor, learn from your grandmother's experience. And ultimately, life is about the quality of the relationships that you build with those around you, whether you're a whale or not. The secrets that my grandmother learned are helping me to survive now. Ensuring that these grandmothers survive to be grandmothers to share their stories and ensuring that these babies live long enough to learn them is what's going to enable these animals to be around for a long time. It's a big ocean. You've got to be able to see what's worth spending your time on. When I'm down there in a submarine and I'm seeing all these animals, it's always about which one of these is new, which one of these has not been seen before to science. Why do these animals come here as opposed to there, and, and where are they going? They're really tangible things that we can do now to start answering some of these questions, but as the technology develops, we can become more and more and more and more sophisticated. Technology is emerging on all fronts. We're using all this side scan sonar and hydrophones to map things out. We can use these sound underwater surveillance systems to actually track whales and see them move all around the ocean. There's a new field called environmental DNA where you just look at the sloughed off cells that are in the water to know who was there. Oh, the whale shark was just here. Can we follow it? And you sniff the trail of the whale shark's DNA. How am I going to understand a shark if I'm thinking like an old world primate? We're totally different. It took me several years to look at the eyes, to look at the hardware, to measure the light, and to build the camera so we could get all these hints into how that shark might be seeing the world. It's like a detective story. What we know as humans about whales comes from just a few scientists so far, like Roger and Katie Payne. They had background in music, and by kind of mapping out the songs, noticing that if they would look at this almost like a song sheet, every 15 minutes or so, there would be a repeat. male humpbacks sing, but the function of their song is still mysterious. The general belief is that whale songs serve the same purposes that bird songs do, as ways for males to advertise for mates and to challenge rivals. But why they change their songs is still unknown. Taking that information from whales and passing that to us humans was one of the most transformative pieces of narrative to feed the Save the Whale movement and maybe save some whales from extinction. These animals are sharing this world that might have been millions of years going on in their world. And suddenly, for the first time, we as humans are tuning in. If people stayed on the shore and never got underwater, how would we ever know that fish like one another? 
when you see fish interact with other creatures, like the octopus and the grouper, who go fishing together. They communicate in ways that we don't know what they're saying, but they know what they're saying. They've been on the Earth for hundreds of millions of years. They've had a long time to figure out these close relationships. Sharks actually might prey on dolphins in a natural setting, but when they are presented with a bait ball, then they work together for this common goal to feed on the fish. We had very large bait balls spread over probably half the size of a football field. We had mobula, we had dolphins, the bait was shifting everywhere, animals were coming in, moving out, just moving so quickly. So we have some orcas around the bowl and also under. So everybody works together as a team, herding the fish. Males, female, everybody is doing this and they will eventually share the stunned fish afterwards, which is pretty amazing to see there is no competition. So everybody is working together and everybody is sharing the prey afterwards. It really takes a long time of being in there, watching the same species of fish to figure out these really interesting things that they're doing. So I think that there's probably a lot of really interesting behaviours out there that we haven't even discovered yet. Jellyfish have mechanisms of self-repair. They're constantly getting like bitten by turtles and chunks getting taken away. 50% of the jellyfish population are wounded. So they've gone through 500 million years living, persisting in the ocean in simplicity, and they've come up with some remarkable ways of living. There's something called the immortal jellyfish and how they age, aging in reverse, which we're just beginning to understand, where they get old and then degenerate back into a youth again. In understanding the gene pathways and how this happens, this could look at, you know, humans, we don't have this capacity to age in reverse. I don't, it's like Benjamin Button and it's here. And it just takes the kind of focus and dedication to look at that jellyfish and to grow that jellyfish and to figure out how to use the best available scientific tools to get at this question. It's just about kind of looking super deeply and letting the secrets unfold. The energy from our star flies through the universe, through our atmosphere, and hits us at the ground. But now, when we go underwater, the ocean properties of water are like pure blue filter. So it's gonna filter out all these other wavelengths except blue. As you go down further, it's primarily blue, blue, blue to 700 meters. And at that level, there's still faint photons of sunlight in the blue range. And we call this the twilight zone. And there, animals are still perceiving a tiny little bit of our sun's energy. Below this, it's gone 24 seven darkness. And it turns out that there's a ton of color vision down in the deep, so it's like they're making enough light down there to be able to be satisfying all the eyes of the deep sea creatures. So it's not this totally dark world down there. It's still light, it's just the animals are making the light rather than the sun. We've designed all this technology to kind of satisfy our visual hardware. As I started looking at other animals, they have totally different hardware. And I've been looking at everything through these silly little primate eyes. We have to overcome our humanness to jump behind the world of a shark or another creature and see the world from their perspective. We found a biofluorescent shark and it only sees right at the blue-green interface. So it's really just tuned to a very similar spectrum to the environment it lives in. This fluorescence was creating greater contrast for the shark. It's like this endless well of information. We're at the very tip of the iceberg. These animals travel thousands of kilometers, navigating open oceans that have no physical landmarks. They have that inert ability to find their way.
They're only sharing our beach for a short point in time, but they need protection because man has brought an ancient species to near extinction. I got involved at a time when hostilities were very real. People came with guns and machetes to poach a turtle. We would protect these animals at all costs. Because on the high tides, when the tide comes up, this area here will be flooded, right? So when the sea turtle lays her egg, the nest requires a constant temperature. And if we recognize that this nest is in a real bad spot, we choose a spot further inland on the beach that's stable. And then we would evaluate if the eggs were able to hatch because of us moving them. And in both cases, we're always right. So as the villagers began to benefit from the tourism that turtle conservation was creating, they saw that the turtle was worth more to them alive than dead. The children really love sea turtles. We educate them, but we involve them. And by so doing, we get them to a level of interest where they want to become actively involved. When we first started this conservation work, we would encounter at the height of the nesting season 30, 40 turtles. Now we encounter over 500. That's significant. Some people argue, well, that's nature. Leave them, why protect them? But remember, humans have to intervene sometimes to help nature keep existing. These are animals with the biggest brain on Earth and the most powerful sonic apparatus. They spend a lot of their time deep down. They're, they're diving for an hour at a time in darkness. Just like a submarine is echolocating, they're kind of... They ping a signal out, and then they wait for that signal to bounce off something and come back as the signal. And from that information, they could get an idea of what's there. They constantly click, and uh, that, that click sometimes can be really loud, and uh, you can feel it in your body. It's like uh, going to a DJ and that feeling that bass. Once I had an experience with a sperm whale, it clicked, my ears almost like bounced back. It's really an amazing feeling, you know. You don't develop a huge, complicated brain if you're not using it. Whales have little channels of communicating where they could talk to each other hundreds of kilometers away using sound. Sperm whales make clicks in sort of rhythmic patterns that we call codas. Any family might have 20 to 25 different coda patterns that they use when they're having conversations with each other. And some of them are unique to different places in the world. In the Eastern Caribbean, they make a lot of what we call a one plus one plus three. And it sounds kind of like this. And that's only ever been recorded in the Caribbean. And it's been identical for the last 35 years. These are really different ways of life that are being labeled by these coda patterns. In the same way that human language is kind of a shorthand for where you come from. You can make a lot of missteps when traveling simply by speaking incorrectly or introducing yourself differently. Do you hug? Do you shake hands? Do you bow? And a growing concern has to do with the noise that we're putting into the ocean. Everything we do impacts everything they're doing. The sound is causing high levels of stress in animals like this. No one wants to live at a rock concert. You can imagine trying to have your home inside an arena while some metal band is playing. And that's increasingly what the ocean feels like. Brine pools are amazing habitat. It's a lake on the bottom of the ocean. And it's this surreal seascape Chemically, each one of them is unique. These brines undoubtedly contain bacteria, archaea, and viruses that are unknown to science. We know that they're incredibly rich in undescribed life forms. They have the perfect cocktail, the perfect recipe for life. These sites aren't just salty, they can be violent, characterized by eruptions and incredibly unstable conditions. So to live in them, you have to not only be hardy, but you have to be able to endure constantly changing conditions because not one day is the same. The organisms that live there, they undergo a constant biological warfare with each other to dominate the environment, to survive in the system. The biochemicals that they produce 
to do that biological warfare are applicable to curing diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's. They produce antibiotics and antivirals that can also be used to improve human health. And we drop targets as we go, so we know exactly where we sample. Exploring these habitats is absolutely necessary because the metabolic potential there has the capacity to change the way we think about medicine, to change the way we think about antibiotics based on our knowledge that we gain from studying these incredible environments in the deep sea. Imagine if I was sent in to Mona Lisa and I come in with a pair of snippers and I'm like, I'm gonna need to cut this baby up a little bit to see what kind of chemical composition is going on there. I'm like, you wouldn't do that, right? We don't have to kill these animals. We don't have to kill to understand. If we could do a single cell, that means we don't need to kill 20,000 animals to be able to really understand that one. We could do our work much more non-invasively. So we are working uh, this year on a new project to deploy uh, tags on orcas. We need to learn more about uh, the diet and how they use the habitat. So by deploying those tags, we get the information we need. It is the least invasive method, it is suction cups. So it is not a scratch on the whale afterwards, which is something we really like. In the deep sea, we use these like robotic claws from the oil and gas industry that gets you the sample, but this is so archaic. So we've been designing something called squishy robot fingers, which are ways to be gentle when we study the deep sea. But I think we could even take this another level. There's some organism, we quickly encase it. It's like a medical checkup. We give it a swab to get its genome. We image it from all directions. We open it up, that animal goes away, and we have more information than we've ever had before. These animals are Mona Lisa's. Our perception of them should change. We should be more delicate. Hydrothermal vents are located on the seabed, often in deep water, but sometimes in shallower water. And they form in areas where new oceanic crust is being formed. You can have 400 degree water here and two degree water over here. It's an accelerometer for chemistry and you can form organic compounds in the absence of biology. Everybody's interested in vents because of the metals, including humans, but the metals are sort of the nuclei for life. When you think about what's required for life, you've got to have an energy source, you've got to have a system that's able to utilize that energy source, and the organisms sort of co-evolve with the rock. And in my mind, that's probably how life originated. There are reservoirs of precious metals in the deep sea, and we do have societal needs for precious metals. It's very short-sighted and dangerous to exploit resources in ecosystems that we don't truly understand how those ecosystems function. Deep sea mining is when people go out and extract minerals from the seafloor. People do this because a lot of the minerals that we have on land are actually being depleted, like copper and zinc, so we're looking to the ocean to get those minerals. We want these minerals for solar panels primarily, and we want them for cell phone boards. It's necessary to advance society and get us off fossil fuels. We simply have no idea about the environmental consequences of a lot of these actions that we're taking in the deep sea. We have tended to go for the quick benefit and we'll deal with the consequences later. Well, I think that has caught up with us. We don't know enough right now to effectively, selectively mine the deep sea without catastrophic consequences. The science has always lagged behind the industrialization. I would like for once to see the science ahead of the industrialization and have the science define the limits of the industrialization. I study things that are beyond their wildest imaginations and that I see things that are brand new to science and to people and to humanity every day. I'm at home in these kinds of environments. It's funny, I, I'm more comfortable here than I probably am on the outside. It wasn't just that I was meant to be out on ships. I was supposed to be in the bottom. I was supposed to be in the deep water. I was supposed to be doing those things that nobody had ever done before. It completes who I am. 
being a deep sea scientist, it does require sacrifice. I mean, we're away from our families for weeks on end, sometimes months on end. It's a constant struggle because you miss parts of your kid's life. My oldest daughter was about to turn three when the oil spill happened in 2010. I was in sea a lot. So between 27 months and 36 months, I was gone probably more than I was there. When I came home after a five week stint in the Gulf, she came running up to me in the airport. She had transitioned from a toddler to a little girl and the little girl was gone and there was this other person there and you don't ever get that back. It was a decision. I was just like, okay, I'm gonna miss transformations. I'm gonna miss really important things. Is it worth it? I had talked to her class about the ocean and one of her friends said something to her and she responded, you know, my mommy, she's the ocean doctor. The ocean is sick and she's trying to make it better. She couldn't even say important. She's like, it's really important. But she understands that it's an important job Every time before I leave, I say, my most important job on this planet is being your mother. But this is part of me too. We're burdened from a time when we thought the ocean was too big to fail. You can't take anything for granted. Even though the ocean is so big, it is sensitive. The oceans are the kidneys of the earth. They recycle material and, and filter it out. Most people don't know that, they're not aware. They see the ocean as a sewer that they can dump anything into and it's out of sight, out of mind. Nothing is out of sight, out of mind on this planet. Everything is connected. We are absolutely in this mix of biogeochemistry and our role so far has been consumptive and destructive. If we are to continue to have a planet that works, we have to heal the harm we've caused. What's the worst case scenario if we deny that the climate is changing, but actually it is, and we do nothing? Then billions of people's lives will be directly affected just by sea level rise alone, let alone the other effects of climate change. So it's not about who's right, it's about the consequences of being wrong in the decision that we make right now. Educating everybody from school children, fishermen, tourists. If we can manage to do that, we have a very good future and we can gain a lot from the ocean. If we could establish the foundation for interspecies communication, we can make first contact. And that's where I hope the future goes. Because what we really want is curious, conscientious, and a self-correcting population. You changing can affect all the people around you to walk instead of drive, to buy a hybrid, to ride a bicycle, to not use single-use plastic. Imagine if everybody did that. The effect would be tremendous. We do have the power of choice about what we eat, what we wear, how we travel. All of the things that we do in an everyday way times 7 billion will make all the difference in the world. We must protect the ocean as if our lives depend on it, because they do. Look at the length of that thing. He is wider than the sun. is long. No one has dived to a thousand meters in Antarctica. My dip, one thousand meters on bottom, over. As a scientist, I could tell you, we discover something new every time we go out. That's been my drive, to discover things, to uncover mysteries that we can then solve. We're on a new frontier of ocean exploration that will bring out the explorer in all of us. We're partnering with the Ocean X Initiative to build a mind-blowing platform for exploration. A research vessel that's a one-of-a-kind ocean conservation and media platform to explore the world's oceans in ways that were never before possible, to create one big wave for the oceans. I think it's really exciting. There's still a massive part of this planet we know nothing about. We need to make people understand what we do in the next 10 years is going to determine what the ocean looks like in 200 years' time. Audiences glued to Blue Planet 2 
have been starkly reminded of the problems of plastics pollution. Fifty years ago, Jacques Cousteau and the Calypso managed to capture our imagination. Somehow we lost that moment. We have to get back that personal connection to the sea. The greatest era of exploration is still ahead of us. Exploring the ocean can help provide a piece to the big puzzle.